Okay, we'll make a start. So first things first, sound check, those at the back, are you happy with this? Thank you. Uh, second thing is, unlike many presenters, it might not sound like it, but English is actually my first language. I will speak too fast and you will object. That is your role. So when things get too fast, let me know. So this presentation is about using, I, I, I have to say I, I spent, this was a, a bit of a rushed session proposal and it's shown in the title and I really intended to tidy this up at some point and come up with something shorter and snappier, but it never happened. So here we are, using Varnish to serve content from your new Drupal site alongside your legacy platform. Having your cake and eating it too, keeping two platforms live at the same time. <clears throat> so again, at the back, there are seats at the front. Feel free to take them and leave again if it's not working for you. So for most website projects, um, the scariest thing is the big switch. It's the day you go live with your brand new website. And we're often faced with problems in that not everything is ready the day we go live. So we're looking for ways to alleviate those problems and make that big switch a little bit scarier. So in particular, we're looking for ways to keep our old and legacy platforms running at the same time. And that's what this presentation is about. So we're going to talk about how we used Varnish, how we used Fastly, uh, some VCL. We're going to talk a bit about the strategy that we, uh, we took to get to, that, uh, get to that decision as to how we'd use those technologies. So uh, a little bit about me. My name is Alan Burke. I'm a director at Anertech. We're celebrating our 15 year anniversary this year. Um, Drupal spon DrupalCon sponsors, Drupal, association partners come and talk to us at our booth and tell us, and we'll tell you about all the amazing things we do. Is that enough of a pitch? Uh, we work with some really, really nice clients and we've got lots of talented people. Okay, we'll go with that, we'll go with that. So yeah, that's what my job is to build websites and keep our clients happy. So let's talk about the problem we have. So the situation is we've built our brand new shiny website and we're about to go live and we've done all our tests and everything looks great. And we're, you know, launch date arrives, we've sent out the invites to the party, everything's looking good. And then it turns out that, oh, oops. What's happened there? the problem is the content is not ready. And this is a completely unprecedented situation because up to now content has always been ready for every website. Just as we go live, the content is ready, but things are different this time. The content is not ready. So uh, what are we gonna do about this? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look and see what content we have ready and what we can go live with and what content is not ready and is, is not ready to go live. Um, so let's have a quick look. Yeah, some of it is ready. And the reality is we're dealing with lots of different stakeholders within the organization. So just a brief aside, the, the client for this particular project is the University of Limerick in Ireland. It's a large third level university um, serving Irish and uh, international students. It's kind of a big deal. They're lovely people. Some of them are here. They're far too shy to say hello uh, until perhaps later on. Um, but uh, they've got to deal with a lot of different uh, entities within the university who provide content for the website and indeed they provide a platform for these entities like um, different events that go live, different faculties or departments or even research institutes within the university. They've got to serve all of these different people and make sure all their content is available on the, on the central website. Um, but not all of these entities are equal in terms of the resourcing they can provide for a new website launch. So we were, they weren't really in a position whereby everything was going to be ready on day one. And the reality is that forcing them to do it or threatening them, threatening them to be ready for this wasn't a viable option, uh, much as though we would like to do that. And I forgot my timer, but we'll see how we get on. Okay, so some of the content's ready and not all and we can't wait. We've done our job as website developers. We've redeveloped the whole new website. Um, again, seats at the front if people want them. Uh, we've re redeveloped this whole new website and we're, you know, we've got our jobs to do. We've got to move on to the next project and we want to go live. Um, so we're going to work out which bits are ready to go live and we can put them live immediately. 
And then the plan over time is as new sections of the website become ready to go live, they will incrementally make it live. So we knew this was coming. We knew this was going to be a problem. Uh, perhaps we were a little bit naive as to the scale of the problem in terms of how much would be ready and how much would not. Um, but we knew it was coming. Uh, we knew about the different entities. So one thing that we did was when we built out the new website, we built it in such a fashion that it would be possible to bring sections of the website live before other sections. So uh, this site is a large group module installation and each group will represent either a website section or it will represent a faculty or department within the university or perhaps those groups will represent events or other short-lived websites that are needed uh, within, within, the web, uh, sorry, within the university itself. Um, so, so what did the old platform look like? So the old platform is, or well, is still interesting because it is still live. Um, the bulk of it was one or uh, I think two large Drupal multi-site installations. Um, they were not particularly well maintained and were not particularly user friendly. And they were seen as the key target that we were going to get live in phase one. But there was lots of other stuff there as well. There was a large selection of standalone Drupal 7 websites that were very much out of date and unmaintained and they needed to be brought live as well. Um, there was some static content, old HTML pages, uh, legacy pages that had been there for some time. Uh, there were some WordPress sites. There were some Perl scripts and duct tape and post-it notes and bubblegum and various other things just holding the whole thing together. But it did work, it did serve the content uh, most of the time. Um, but, but in many ways, it doesn't really matter what the old website looked like. And that's, that, that's the point I wanted to make here, is that regardless of what platform you're coming from, you can come up with a plan to uh, work with an approach like this. It isn't necessary that it was a, a Drupal 7 website or any kind of Drupal website. It could have been anything at all. And uh, if you're in any way at all able to split old and split new with some kind of a rule, however complicated that might be, then this approach should work. Um, let's see. And when the, when the, from our perspective, the key part was to keep those rules within the URL. There are other things we you could use for rules like proximity to the user or age of the content or various other things you could have used as rules. But we were going to base our rules based on the URL. So one of the key things was we need to map the, uh, the URL paths to, uh, sorry, the, the key, literally the key was the first part of the URL. That's what we we're going to use to define what to find an old part of the website and what to find a new part of the website. So as we built out the new Drupal, uh, well, it's not Drupal 10, but anyway, the new Drupal uh, 8 website at the time, we uh, worked and all of the groups fell into this first part section that you see on the screen. So we built out new sections of the new site using that as the key for all of the new groups. And groups represent sections or, like I said, departments, um, research institutes, events. And that worked very well. We were able to come up with a plan going, okay, such and such a department is ready. They're on the new platform. Their content is ready and it's been maintained possibly in both platforms for a short period of time before the go live. So the first thing we needed to do was to split the traffic. So what I mean by this is as requests for a URL came in, to the web server, we needed to find a way to take some of that traffic and send it to the legacy platform and take the rest of the traffic and send it to the new platform. Um, and what we needed was a front-end server that would do this work. So we have our own web server. Um, as it happens, it was running on platform.sh. That's not particularly important in terms of the requirements for this. Um, the legacy platform was there. We knew, we knew more than we wanted to know about the legacy platform. Um, in many ways, all we really cared about was the fact that over there, at a particular URL, lived legacy content. And if that's all I knew, I would have been a much happier man. Unfortunately, I learned a lot more about what lay behind that legacy platform. And you guys are going to learn some of it too. So we sat down and we worked out what, what options did we have to split this traffic. 
And it turns out that it really falls into two broad categories in terms of our options to split the traffic. Um, so uh, what we're looking at here is a couple of software tools that you could use to spin up on some bare metal and manage yourself and re write the logic in the um, domain specific language of your choice to split the traffic. So we looked at Varnish and we looked at an option of running our own Varnish server. Uh, we looked at tools like Squid and Nginx and Pound and a few more. Uh, Pound, interestingly, didn't have a logo that I could use on this site, so uh, that, enough was, that was enough to rule it out because I wouldn't be able to talk about it in a presentation. Um, but, but again, like the, I guess the, the point I'm, I keep trying to make here is it's more, what's important here is how we did it, not the specific tools. We're going to talk a little bit about the specific tools, but you have a number of choices here. And if some of these things are within your stack or within your expertise, then they're totally valid in terms of use cases that you could use for this kind of a solution. Um, but we're not huge fans of running our own servers. Uh, we have friends who do that for us. And uh, another option is to use your own provider. So the only problem with using your own provider, or maybe not the only problem, but the main problem with using your own provider that you've used to build the website is that by the time the traffic hits your new, newly minted server, it's sometimes a little bit late. Uh, by that, I mean you want to intercept the request relatively early so that you can apply your, your logic before you and it decides which, uh, sorry, which URLs should be served from the legacy platform and which URLs should be served from your new platform. Now, I was promised heckling from some people in the room, but Jochen has uh, failed to heckle at the appropriate opportunity. Of course, there are other hosting providers. If only there was somebody else who could help you out with this stuff as well. So uh, I, I, I apologize for the lack of Jochen's logo on this slide as well. So Freistelbox, of course, could have handled this as well. Um, uh, now, the, the, uh, the limitations from a uh, technical perspective might be those Im Im imposed by your hosting provider. So at any of these providers, if you go and say, hey, I want to run my own custom varnish configuration, depending on how much money you're willing to throw at them, they'll either laugh at you or happily take your money. Um, and in most cases, the amount of money I was willing to throw at these people or, or I had in my budget to throw at these people wasn't really enough to stop them laughing. So it didn't seem like it was going to be a realistic option for me to use their, uh, um, use their infrastructure to run the custom scripts on some of the software we talked about it there. Now, for the sake of, a, of a, uh, an example, uh, platform have some routing rules that you can put in a, in a routing file and it, it isn't quite... Um, malleable enough for the use case that we had in mind, but it might be malle malleable enough for your use case. So there, it's, sort of, it's a very early um, way to intercept the traffic and apply some logic to it. Uh, it just wasn't quite flexible enough for the requirements that we had. Um, so the other option is there is to look at some other dedicated cloud-based services that will, um, by, its bread and, by their bread and butter, they will intercept traffic and do something with it. So, the first, so we looked at uh, a CDNs that are out there and what they could do for us. And generally speaking, pretty much all CDNs will have a concept of um, origins. So an origin is a place where the content lives. So when they get a request in for a URL, they know that they can send the traffic to a particular origin and then send that traffic back out to the client. Now, um, ordinarily, um, they will let you configure multiple origins. So just like our requirements, we had a legacy system and we had our new system. Um, we were able to define those multiple origins within our, our, our CDN of choice. Now, there are other things that you can do with origins. You can have uh, origins that are more used based on, say, uh, geographic location could be used as a rule to prefer one origin over another, or response time or uptime or things like that. Um, what, what was slightly unusual about this was we were going to segment the traffic purely based on what the URLs were, nothing else, not staleness or uptime or things like that, things you would ordinarily use a CDN for. Um, I'm reluctant to leave water on the table with two laptops, so sorry about that. Right. 
So in the end, we went with Fastly. So we've had good experience with Fastly as a CDN on, on multiple products. It's got an excellent UI um, in that it's very easy to use. You don't, in term, and for most projects, it's not quite a set and forget, but it doesn't take an awful lot of configuration to get it working with normal, uh, normal websites. Um, one of the other things that was really useful for us was that under the hood, Fastly runs Varnish. Now, I'm sure they run lots of other things too, but their, their key tool for serving their cached content is Varnish. So as well as that being under the hood, Varnish, uh, they also let you add on custom snippets of VCL code. So VCL is, I think it's Varnish configuration language. It's a domain specific tool that you can use to apply this specific logic. So you're, you're not just limited by a rules UI to let you do specific things, which is there, but you can also um, add on your own specific snippets of VCL. And that was really key for our use case because we couldn't come up with logic that fitted neatly into a UI on, on Fastly or any of the other tools either. So uh, I think this is the only code I have in the presentation. I have no idea how legible that is at the back. But don't worry, I'm going to walk you through it. And it's, it's not particularly important what it does, but I just wanted to point out that I had absolutely no knowledge of how to write VCL. So if there's anyone here who knows more about VCL, you can give me the list of things that is wrong with this uh, much later on, please. But basically, that's the code that translates the slide we saw earlier on. It takes the inbound request, finds out what the first part of the URL is, and then runs some logic based on that to send it to the legacy platform or to send it to the new platform. Um, and one of the, the, the key things that we needed was the ability, um, so the logic itself, you know, it's not woefully complex, but it wasn't something that we wanted to be updating every day, nor was it something that we were in a position to hand over to the client and say, hey, you can maintain all of this in your custom code. So one of the things we needed was a simple way to update the rules on an ongoing basis. So we'll, we'll take a step back briefly and we want to talk about the plan for after we had gone live. So we go live, we know we've got new content, we know we've got old content and old content comes from legacy and new content comes from the new platform and that's all very good. But we needed a plan to make sure that on an ongoing basis we can bring new sections of the website live. So the way that looked, the way that worked was we um, use a thing called lookup tables. So lookup tables are relatively simple key value pairs or a set of key value pairs within, um, within Varnish and within Fastly that we could just put in a list of URLs and say, hey, this list of URLs um, is in one specific group. Sorry, not URLs, just, just sections. Um, and the, the useful thing about this is that it's trivial through the UI to add and remove items from these tables. So th this was very important for us. So we, what we wanted to do was make it very simple to bring new sections of the website live. So as an example, whenever the library site was ready on the new platform, it couldn't be a very onerous or complex task to make that section live. It needed to be something that we'd done really quickly and really, really easily. And that's where these lookup tables came. So they're really useful. When those rules change, it happens instantly. Uh, you don't have to restart uh, your Fastly configuration or clear your caches, short of the caching rules that are in place for you know, keeping content there for a period of time. Um, those things change straight away. So this was, this was really useful, and this is probably the key factor that we used in deciding to use Fastly. It, it just it fitted really well with our plan for this site. So let's see. And our plan, our first plan, was to what we'll call default to new. So what we really, really wanted as a scenario was when a URL came in, by default, we would send it to the new platform unless for some reason it matched a value and it had to go to the old platform. So this seemed logical to us. It seemed like um, this would work. You know, the client would sit down with us and give us a, a long list of, hey, here are all the old sections that we're not quite ready with. Please put them in your lovely list and then we'll take them away from that list whenever they're ready, et cetera, et cetera. And that was all going very well until we hit a 3,000 line HD access file in the root of the legacy platform. Now this, 
3,000 lines isn't the end of the world, but this HD access file was uh, maintained, for want of a better word, um, by a lot of different people who didn't really know what was happening with it, and it turned out that the safest answer to any change or addition was, we'll just put it at the bottom and it'll keep working. So there was uh, auto-generated segments of HD access, there was handwritten segments that conflicted with other segments further up in the HD access file. Um, it, it was frankly too much at the point of launch and we had to go with the plan B. So the plan B was we had to default to legacy. So what happens or what happened at point of launch was that when traffic came in, by default, it would be sent to the legacy platform unless we knew which sections were ready to go live. So instead, we had a different list of, hey, here are all the sections of the new website that are ready to go. If the URL matches any of those, that, what, that traffic gets sent to the new server and sent back up to the CDN and back down to the client. And that worked relatively well, relatively well, but we did hit a couple of gotchas. So the first gotcha we hit was system paths. So things like slash user and slash, uh, let's see, slash user, um, slash admin, sites default files, and more as we learned along the way. So there's certain paths that are just there at the, at the root of Drupal that Drupal expects to be available to use. And over time, as we saw things not working, this is pretty go live and we started doing our testing, uh, we found certain things not working within Drupal. There were some very obscure ones whereby everything looked fine, we were pretty much ready to go, but then we went to start using the media UI and suddenly images weren't appearing. So again, through a process of elimination, we could see that some of the requests for certain Ajax callbacks were being sent to the legacy platform, not to the new Drupal platform. So in some way, it wasn't too bad. All we had to do was make an addition to our lookup table and all of that started working again. So immediately you can see that one of the potentials for problems is if a particular path is somehow a system path on your new Drupal website, but might have been a valid content path on your legacy platform. So for whatever reason, if you have slash admin as a valid URL of content on their old legacy platform, that's gonna present a problem when you present your new Drupal website. Uh, we, we had some stuff like that, but we, we found ways around it by just getting a little bit more specific in the rules that we had in place. But it's something, uh, just something to note that what, what might be considered a valid path in your old legacy platform could also be a valid path in your new platform and you'll have to come up with logic like checking cookies or something like that to determine where to send the, the appropriate traffic. Uh, let's see, any other gotchas to talk about? Um, yeah, so the, the other main gotcha was things that uh, were items of content that lived under the Drupal root. So things like slash cookies or slash privacy or um, even things like um, slash cookies slash privacy, I'm, I'm leaving some out. Anyway, th those kind of, that kind of content, we, we tried to convince the client, could we not just leave all that content under a specific section, you know, like slash new slash cookies or slash home slash cookies or something like that, and that didn't wash. So what we had to do then was maintain another list of content that lived at the top level and again should have been sent to the new platform. So that was fine, we came up with a, we found, we hit the problem, we worked through it with the client, came up with a solution and the solution was yet another lookup table uh, and that's fine. Now, one of the advantages of this setup, uh, yeah, we're okay for time. Uh, one of the advantages of this setup is that it actually became really easy to add new content to the new site. So as the client is working on a section for say, slash library, um, they could work on that at a specific URL that represented the new platform. They could add all the new content, they could do testing in-house, they could get approval from their, their own internal clients. And when they were ready, all they had to do was just make one change to the lookup table. So that, that was a nice sort of feature that we gained by having a default to legacy uh, approach that we had to go with at GoLive. Uh, let's see, and now we, we kept that, what we did was we made sure that if anybody accessed the new platform directly, that that, con that access was restricted by IP, so, uh, you know, regular people could not get in there and have a look at new traffic that was, you know, in a live website but not ready for public consumption. Um, one of the questions uh, posed to me is, 
Will we ever be done? So at what point can we say this temporary solution is now finished with and we, you know, we can take away this uh, custom infrastructure that was not really intended or for long-term use. It was there as a crutch to get us from old site to new site. Well, uh, the answer was that the, fir the first thing we had to do was tackle that 3,000 line um, HD access file. So in fairness, <laughs> the client sat down, worked through it line by line, and came back to us with, well, actually, of that 3,000 line file, here's a spreadsheet with a list of valid redirects, valid rewrites, and uh, do, what, do with them what you have to do, Anatech. So it turned out that was relatively straightforward. They were all reproduced as either redirects within the new platforms set up, or more, more than not, we used to use the redirect module in Drupal to use those as content within Drupal. So once that was in place, we were able to switch the logic at the front end and Fastly to be a new platform by default. And we added another table, which represented the traffic that should now be sent to the legacy platform. Now, at this stage, that's a much shorter list. It's down to, I don't know, something like 10 or so subsites uh, the last time I checked. And the process for going live now is slightly different. What it means is that um, as a new site goes live, what we do is we delete from that lookup table and the, the traffic then just hits the new platform. So it's, it's a, the, the logic that you saw in that uh, VCL snippet is actually a little bit simpler now. And whenever that table is empty, whenever the last section goes live, we can take away all of this uh, custom uh, VCL logic and we can just use Fastly as, as God intended, as a CDN that caches the site and delivers good performance. Um, let's see. So lessons learned. Um, I guess the first lesson is that this is all doable. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad idea because the alternative of waiting for all of the content to be ready was just not feasible. And no amount of, <laughs> no amount of forcing or cajoling or threatening was going to have the content ready for go live. So there, there, you know, there's, multiple other ways of managing, managing that particular problem, but this, as a way to manage it, worked out pretty well. Um, one of the concerns might be, well, if the new platform has a completely different design, then the user experience could be pretty jarring as they move around and hit old section and new section. But we could see from traffic patterns that didn't happen a whole pile. Uh, people generally went to a specific site and they stayed there for most of their traffic. Um, the other thing that was an aid to us that we, while we rebuilt the um, design in, in modern CSS compared to the legacy platform, it wasn't a radical different redesign. So what, what user stories move from legacy to new and that kind of stuff, it wasn't particularly jarring. Um, this was more complex. We did have a few more moving parts, uh, which we managed to eliminate. And that was definitely a lesson to learn is there are things we could have done to make this a little bit fancier, but in the end, it just represented relatively brittle infrastructure that we didn't really want to have to maintain. So we, we strive for simplicity and we, we got there as far as we could. Um, the last thing is, if you're going to tackle something like this, you're going to learn an awful lot about caching, about HTTP headers. Um, you're, if, if you literally follow it down to the, uh, to the varnish level, you'll have to learn a little bit of VCL. Uh, but it turned out the VCL was fine and we, I got managed to get it working, although I'll be told by somebody that I could have done it much better in a few minutes time, but that's, and, that, and that's great. Um, let's see, any other bits? Uh, I suppose one other part that um, we, we hit a little bit of luck on this in that we had already decided on Fastly as a tool and then uh, the project was spun up on platform.sh and it turned out that their subscription included a Fastly subscription. So while I showed you the lovely UI and you might be familiar with it or you can have a look at the nice Fastly UI, that actually wasn't available to us. All of the configuration was done using the Fastly, uh, sorry, yeah, let me start that again. The Fastly user interface wasn't available to us for this project. So all of the changes we had to make were using the API, using um, just custom curl commands to update new VCL statements and things like that. And when we do add and remove things from the lookup tables, again, we use their API to do that. So uh, it made it a little bit more problematic, but from a, um, I guess, moving parts 
perspective, it, it was actually very good because all of that Fastly infrastructure was provided and, and configured for us. All we had to do was worry about uploading our custom VCL. And I think that's about all I have to talk about. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so do we have any questions that came in through the tool? Yes. Okay, shoot. Long time listener, first time caller. This is Deirdre in Galway. She's wondering why the grass was not cut before you left. Because uh, it'll still be there when I get back. Next question. Okay. Uh, we have no questions. <laughs> we have no questions. <laughs> but uh, I have one here. Okay. Um, and I, I, I don't know how, how fair this is. Uh, and I, I know our client is here as well, so maybe um, he can answer. Um, if we didn't take this approach here, okay, and we said we're not supporting two uh, platforms at the same time, you have to get everything finished. Would we be quicker getting all the new sites moved across? Or you know, would they get the finger out and start doing that? Um, because say this is a temporary solution that's now in place 1.5 years. And counting. Uh, and counting. So I guess it's to you, Michael. Uh, if we didn't do this, would you have said, okay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get it done or do a bigger migration? Or what, what, what was the alternative to, to this? You'd have to come up. I didn't mean Round of applause for Michael <laughs> from UL. He loves the attention, loves it. Um, I didn't write the hashtag yeah, access file, by the way. That yeah, wasn't we, me. We know that, we know that, yeah. Um, it had to be done this way because there is oh, 500 websites, all of different shapes and forms, different platforms. They all had to be brought across. They all had different stakeholders. Most of them didn't want to do it would be the answer, um, they still don't. Uh, we have to handhold all of them and bring them across bit by bit. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a visual arts website that has 2,500 pieces of content on it. So that's what I'm doing day by day, every day. So we have to do it this way, basically, is the answer. They have to be brought across one by one and handheld. But it will be over, I think, I think eventually. Yeah, and I've heard that one before as well. Um, Michael, do you want to stay here? Because there's a few more questions and you might actually be able to answer some of them as well. Okay. Um, I'll just point out one of the gotcha that we didn't hit on this project that you may hit in a different scenario. Because of the way the legacy platform was configured, um, user accounts were already a mess. You know, if you were somebody who had responsibility, like Michael, to look after content across the entire legacy platform, you had to have multiple different logins across loads of different systems. So the fact that we introduced one more site with another new login, that didn't represent an extra burden. If you had a, a very you know, normal system whereby you had a single login on the old platform and then another on the new platform, that might present a problem that you would have to deal with. But that was not one that we had to deal with. Okay, we, we've got some questions here now. Um, Philippe wants to know, is the website multilingual and could you extend this setup to a multilingual application? Uh, yes, it is, not as much as it possibly should be, uh, but you know, it, it is. There, there's elements of multilingual there and it, it has to be expanded. Um, the short answer is yes, it might make your routing rules a little bit more complex because you have to deal with the fact that certain languages might not be available on certain sections. So I imagine your logic would have to be a little bit more uh, complex, but from a, from a technical perspective, no problem at all. If, if you can constrain the logic to what's in the, the URLs, then yeah, that will work. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, which one do I think looks like an interesting question? James wants to know, could you please go into some more detail about how you split system paths that are the same between both platforms? For example, how do you know which site an AJAX request was for? Uh, let's see, how do we know? Uh, on the old platform, most, uh, of the requ any requ uh, sorry, most of the requests for AJAX content would have been at the uh, second part of the URL. So if we take a simple, uh, just a, a sample URL of slash library, well in that case the AJAX requests would have all started with slash library, so the routing rules would have redirected those AJAX requests to the legacy platform as well. Um, we, one of the things that we defi definitely did was that at the top level, uh, 
URLs, we, we, every URL that we wanted to handle at the top level on the new site had to make it into a table. So uh, Ajax callbacks, paths for content, robots.txt, changelog.txt if we wanted to serve it, um, things like that. All of that, we had to explicitly say, yes, we want to serve that file or that path from the new platform. Uh, Philip wants to know, I think, Michael, maybe for you, if you want to grab the mic here, um, how did we handle Google and other bots? And for example, was there any effect on indexing or, or site searching or analytics? No, I think all the sites had sitemaps. Sorry, all the sites had sitemaps themselves, and they just all had to be submitted individually. But we came up with a way of doing that too. Um, so it was simple enough that they, that took care of most of it, really. Okay. Um, Mario wants to know how do we deal with registered users across two environments? Uh, we, we tell them to log in twice in two separate places. Um, we didn't have anything more elegant than that. But yeah, like I said, there was lots of different systems where people had to log in and this was just one more. It didn't present any extra burden really. Well, one of the things actually that was quite interesting, it's not just two platforms because each, each section in the UL website, so slash library, slash uh, art and science, slash whatever else, each of those was actually an individual uh, Drupal installation. Yeah. So it was actually 50 Drupal websites that we migrated down into one Drupal website. So now they can log into two systems rather than uh, 51 systems, which was a win. Yeah, that's a very good point. So there was a presentation about the migration approach and some of the site build approach last year, so I kind of stayed away from all that this year. So you can have a look at that on, on, on the web somewhere. Okay, and this is the last question that's been submitted so far. We can open up to the floor then. Uh, Florian wants to know, um, how do we keep the legacy link on the new platform? Uh, well, I, yeah, I probably should have made this clear. To the end user, this is all entirely transparent. So from the user's perspective, they have no clue, ideally, which content they're seeing is coming from the legacy site or from the new site. And this was a key objective. We didn't want them to know that the content they were seeing was either new or old. It, should, it doesn't matter to them, and we wanted to keep that um, invisible. You know, the, the more observant will have spotted a slightly fresher design on some sections of the website, but uh, from a URL perspective or a, a traffic perspective, it should have been entirely transparent to them. I th hope that answers the question. Okay, that's the end of our questions. Is there any questions from the floor or anybody want extra um, explanation? Were you using any of the other abilities of Fastly, like caching, or actually using it as a CDN alongside using it to split the traffic between the different sites? Uh, yes. Um, yes, we were. So given that Fastly was part of the platform available, um, we were definitely going to use it for caching. Um, I, I learned more than I really needed to know about caching and lifetimes and um, we, we had one particularly entertaining problem to deal with. Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure how it happened, but redirects on the legacy platform were served with a relatively long cache lifetime. And despite efforts, this cache lifetime couldn't be removed and no one really wanted to tackle the HD access file to remove said caching header uh, from redirects on the old platform. And in the end, we used Fastly's logic to remove that caching header so that the redirects weren't cached. And that, that caused a problem because there were, there's a lot of what we call temporary URLs, like marketing URLs that are used for a particular period of time that are just redirecting to a particular piece of the website with perhaps a longer section. So ul.ie slash open days redirects to a specific page, maybe further down for a particular department. So these URLs were being cached for quite a long time in Fastly um, because as we found out, the headers were, were caching those. So what we did was we just simply removed those caching headers from at the Fastly layer, and because uh, there was only no really need to cache them anyway. Any more? Okay, thanks very much. I'll be around the Anatech booth, and I'll be up here if there's anybody else who has any more questions and comments. Thanks very much. <laughs>